This video is for the standard level content from D1.2 on protein synthesis. Protein synthesis will happen in two major steps, transcription and translation. We'll talk about transcription first. So transcription is the process of using a strand of DNA as a template to create a strand of RNA. Now we only want to do this for the gene that is being expressed, okay? So we're only going to transcribe a segment of DNA called a gene, genes code for proteins. And in order to do this, we'll need this enzyme called RNA polymerase. So RNA polymerase is shown here in green. It's this big green blob looking thing. And it does a couple of things. First, it's going to separate the strands. In DNA replication, that was done by helicase. In this case, it's done by RNA polymerase. And then I love the name for RNA polymerase because it tells you what the function is. It is an enzyme that synthesizes a polymer of RNA. So how does it do that? Well, it uses one of the strands of DNA as a template to put RNA nucleotides together, and it knows what sequence to put together because it follows the rules of complementary base pairing. It also connects the RNA nucleotides together by um, creating those sugar phosphate bonds, those phosphodiester bonds, to create one continuous strand of mRNA. And then one important thing to notice is that um, when we think about the rules of complementary base pairing in RNA, um, A does not pair with T. Adenine does not pair with thymine. Instead, adenine pairs with uracil. So RNA won't have any Ts. It won't have thymine. It still has cytosine, and it is complementary to guanine. But this is one difference we want to keep an eye on. RNA is single-stranded, and we're only going to use one of the strands of DNA, of one of those parent strands, as a template to synthesize that RNA. So how do we know which strand actually gets transcribed? Well, these strands can be renamed into the sense strand and the antisense strand. The sense strand actually contains the genetic material to be copied, so I have that up here. You'll notice that that is complementary to the antisense strand. So this does not include the genetic information to be copied. However, it is the one that is used as a template during transcription. And here's why. So I'm gonna do my RNA in green here, and I'm gonna use the antisense strand as a template, and I'm going to follow the rules of complementary base pairing, whoops. <laughs> um, so remembering to replace, and I see an error here, here we go, remembering that RNA does not have thymines, it has uracil instead. Okay, so here's my RNA strand. By using the antisense strand as the template, you'll notice that my RNA is actually identical to the DNA in the sense strand, minus, of course, this exception that uracil replaces thymine, but otherwise they are identical. So this complementary base pairing and the use of the antisense strand helps to ensure that the genetic information on that sense strand is actually represented by the mRNA molecule. So if I'm looking at this picture down here, this sense strand is not being utilized as the template. The anti-sense strand is being used as the template to make this strand of mRNA. And it's really the hydrogen bonding between that comp those complementary base pairs that ensure that that continuity of genetic information persists. So here's what we mean. Adenine can only pair with thymine because their molecular arrangement is just so that when they line up, they can form two hydrogen bonds between them. Cytosine and guanine, their molecular structure aligns so that they can form three hydrogen bonds. 
If you try to form a hydrogen bond between, let's say, guanine and adenine, their molecular structures are not compatible for hydrogen bonding. So this continuity of genetic information being you know, rewritten onto mRNA is all because of this complementary base pairing rule. When DNA is in its double-stranded form, it is incredibly stable, and this stability really prevents any changes um, or mutations from happening in that base sequence. However, when this DNA is temporarily separated, um, that complementary base pairing, those hydrogen bonds, don't exist, and so we have a decrease in the stability. So that instable form in DNA allows mutations to occur more frequently. So um, something to keep an eye on there in terms of this theme of continuity and change, continuity persists in replication and transcription, change can occur when there are mutations, and those mutations are usually going to occur when the strands of DNA have been separated. Now we said that transcription is only going to occur along a small segment of DNA, and that small segment is a gene, genes code for proteins. Okay, so gene expression is the production of a protein using the sequence of bases in a gene. So your cell, or a single cell in your body, has lots and lots of genes but different cells will express some genes and turn other genes off or not express them. Cells will only express the genes that are needed at that time. When we say that genes are expressed, what we really mean is that they are transcribed and then later translated into proteins. So for example, in a human cell, in a liver cell, liver cells are going to turn on all of the genes that they need in order to be a liver cell, okay, and do what liver cells do. They are not going to express the genes for how to be a muscle cell or for the functions of a skin cell. So it's important to note that all of the cells in an organism contain the full genome, just that not all genes are expressed. That control of genetic expression um, is further developed in another topic, but we wanna be able to relate gene expression with transcription. If you need to express a gene, then you need transcription to take place first. Now, we've already talked about transcription. So transcription is using DNA as a template to make RNA. And then the next step that we'll talk about is something called translation. And then in translation, we're going to be taking that RNA and translating it into a polypeptide. So it's important to kind of maybe add some more detail here. When we say RNA, we mean mRNA. The M stands for messenger. It is literally a message being carried from the DNA to the ribosomes where that polypeptide will be produced, okay? Now, when we say polypeptide, remember, polypeptides are long chains of amino acids. So whereas here we're making an mRNA strand using nucleotides, during translation, we're going to be making a polypeptide by connecting many amino acids. So this mRNA code gets translated into a polypeptide sequence of amino acids in the cytoplasm on a ribosome. So here I've got a picture of the full process. We'll talk about all the parts. So this big kind of blue blob here, this is the ribosome. And then this strand is the mRNA. mRNA is going to have many base sequences and they are read in groups of three at a time. These groups of three bases are called codons. On each strand of DNA, there will be a start codon that tells the ribosome where to actually start translating, and there will be a stop codon that will be at the end where translation should be terminated. 
And this molecule right here, this is something called tRNA. So it's a strand of RNA. Guys, it's still single-stranded. I know it doesn't look like it, but it's one strand that's looped in on itself. So still RNA. The T stands for transfer, It is literally transferring amino acids to the ribosome. And it's got two important structures that we want to pay attention to. It carries a specific amino acid at the top, and it also has a group of three bases that kind of stick out from the bottom called an anti-codon. So on mRNA, the groups of three bases are called codons. tRNA has an anti-codon, and of course, codons and anti-codons are matched together following the rules of complementary base pairing. Now, we kind of mentioned that the ribosome looks like one big blob. It's not. It's actually made of two subunits. So the small subunit is this part on the bottom here, okay, where the RNA, the mRNA is going to bind, okay? So this is our small subunit. The large subunit is exactly what it sounds like. It's this larger part up here on the top. And this part of the ribosome is going to contain binding sites for tRNA and also a catalytic site to help create these peptide bonds between the amino acids that the tRNA molecules are carrying in. Let's do an overview of this process. We'll go in and add some more details later, but translation starts like this. The mRNA is going to attach to the small subunit of the ribosome. And then a tRNA molecule that has, remember, an anticodon that is complementary to the start codon will attach, okay? So these anticodons, when they're complementary to the mRNA codons, will attach. The ribosome is then going to slide down to the next codon and the next tRNA molecule will attach. The amino acids from the tRNA molecules are joined together. So we can see that happening here, that the tRNA molecule carrying this amino acid um, is right next to this tRNA molecule, and we're going to form a peptide bond between them. And eventually this tRNA molecule will be holding this big long chain. So this continues until a stop codon is reached, at which point all of the parts will disassemble. The large and the small subunit of the ribosome will come apart, the mRNA will detach, and this peptide or this polypeptide um, will detach as well. Now let's even see how this would work. Okay, so again, we're going to read these codons on mRNA in groups of three, right? So a codon has three base sequences. And on tRNA, so that's going to look a little bit something like this. We'll have tRNA, that's a single continuous loop, but kind of sticking out here are, are going to be three base sequences, okay? So something like this. And those will, of course, be complementary to the three bases on this mRNA. Now, each tRNA carries a specific amino acid, okay? And so this tRNA that has this anticodon happens to carry the amino acid called methionine. Then the next tRNA molecule with an anticodon that is complementary to the codon on mRNA will attach. And again, it has a unique anticodon and it carries a unique amino acid. And finally, my third tRNA with its complementary anticodon carries a different amino acid. This time it would be arginine. So again, what we're going to need is a peptide bond, okay, to connect these amino acids together. And that is eventually how we will get our polypeptide. Now, there are some really cool features of the genetic code that are going to have applications both within this topic and to other topics. First of all, the genetic code is read in triplets. That's groups of three. So let's back up for a moment. There are only four possible bases, right, in DNA, A, T, G, and C, or if we're talking about RNA, A, U, G, and C. If we read these one at a time, that would only mean that there's only four combinations, an A, a G, 
or a C, a T, that's not very much, okay? There's not a lot of variety there. But when you read things in groups of three, okay, and I have four possible bases, that means that there are 64 different combinations of those four bases. So that 64 is a lot greater than just four. That's going to give me a lot wider variety, and I'm going to have um, a lot more opportunity to produce unique amino acid sequences. The DNA code or the genetic code is also universal, and that means that the same codons will make the same amino acids in all organisms and viruses. So I want to show you how to read this codon chart down here. So codons, again, are read in groups of three. Let's just say I have a codon that reads U. A, C, okay, so U, A, C. I'm going to find the first letter, which is U, and so that's right here, and that tells me I'm looking for something in this row, okay. All right, so that's the first letter. We can check that off. Then I'm going to find my second letter, which is A, and the second letter is right here, it's across the top, and I'm looking for A, so that means I'm looking for something in this column. All right, well what that really means is that I'm looking for something in the intersection of where that row and where that column are. I'm finally going to find the third letter, okay, and it's important that I'm using my mRNA codon here. My third letter is C, so I'm gonna find that third letter over here, and I'm going to follow it this way. And I'm gonna double check. This says UAC, and so that means that I am making this amino acid tyrosine. So UAC, let's try that again so we can actually read it. UAC is right here, and this is the amino acid tyrosine. UAC codes for tyrosine in your cells, in the cells of a tiger, in the cells of a yeast. Okay, in the cell, or I shouldn't say the cell, but even in a virus, right? So that means that the genetic code is universal. It is also degenerate. Now, in English, we often use this word degenerate to mean something bad, but in this case, it's actually very good. This means that different codons can code for the same amino acid. For example, if I have the codon U, 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 that is going to make phenylalanine. U, U, and then U, I see it right here. If I have a different amino acid, like let's say I have a mutation, and I, that changes to U, U, C, Okay, UUC also makes phenylalanine. So degenerate means different codons can code for the same amino acid. And this is actually a huge advantage in case you have a mutation. It means that that mutation might not actually result in a change in the amino acid sequence. So I made this table a little bit bigger. I recommend that you pause this video and use this codon chart to try to figure out what amino acid sequence would be translated by this mRNA sequence. So my suggestion is that the first thing that you do is to separate these into codons. Codons are groups of three. And if I look at A, U, and then C, A, U, C is right here, and that codes for isoleucine. AAG codes for lysine, CCA codes for proline, and UGA codes for one of those stop codons. So if you're doing this on an exam and you get a stop codon, you must stop. You can write the word stop, but if there are additional codons after that, do not translate them, okay? That literally means to stop. Now put yourself to this test, okay? If I give you an mRNA sequence, can you work backwards and see what DNA was used to transcribe and make it? Can you figure out what the tRNA anticodons are? And can you figure out what amino acids that would code for? Well, how did you do? <laughs> 
This mRNA, if I'm working backwards to get my DNA, notice that these are all complementary base pairs. If I want to know what the tRNA anticodons are, again, they are also complementary. And then I can use this chart to find the amino acid sequence. Again, to find that amino acid sequence, I want to be using the mRNA, split this up into threes, okay, into those codons. You can then use that chart, and we should be finding that this codes for proline, cysteine, and valine. Now that we have the basics down, let's dive into a little bit more detail on how this process occurs. On the large subunit of the ribosome, we are going to have three binding sites, the A site, the P site, and the E site, and tRNAs will move through them in that order. At the A site, this is the initial binding site for the, each tRNA, and this is also where the peptide bond is going to be formed. So this tRNA right here is in the A site, okay? That A site is again part of the large subunit. At this A site, okay, this tRNA has um, bound with the mRNA, and this polypeptide that's already in existence is going to get transferred to this tRNA molecule through the formation of the peptide bond. So this tRNA is going to let go of this amino acid, and that chain will be passed to this tRNA molecule. At the P site, so this one is right here, at the P site, this is where this empty tRNA molecule um, is going to be. So again, what's happening here is that this tRNA, or sorry, this ribosome is sliding down the mRNA and it's forcing these tRNA molecules into these sites. So once this tRNA molecule has passed the polypeptide chain to the one in the A site, it is now now empty. And then again, as that ribosome continues to move down, tRNA molecules will find themselves in this last binding site called the E site. And this is literally um, where these tRNA molecules are going to exit this process. They are empty um, and they are no longer carrying amino acids. So they will be moved through that E site and then I say like ejected, okay, or they exit. And so this will continue to happen as this ribosome slides down the mRNA. It is a repeating cycle and it will end with the elongation of this polypeptide chain. Theme D is all about continuity and change. Those rules of complementary base pairing ensure that there is continuity of that genetic sequence. But what about change? Well, this happens with mutations. Mutations are changes to the base sequence of a gene. One of the types of mutations that you have to know is something called a base substitution. And this is the change to one base in a gene. So it might look a little something like this, where I have three DNA base letters and I'm noticing that there's a change in the base sequence. Now, this might change the amino acid sequence or it might not. If I were to transcribe and translate these, my original sequence, well, let's see, what would the mRNA read? It would read GAA. Now, GAA makes glutamic acid. Let's then create an mRNA sequence with my mutated DNA. So this would be GAG. GAG also makes glutamic acid. So in this case, the mutation has not caused a change in my amino acid sequence. Let's imagine another scenario where it's not this letter that experiences a mutation, but this one. And instead of a T, there's an A there. Well, let's go ahead and transcribe this into mRNA. So again, this would be GAA, and GAA makes glutamic acid. If I transcribe this mutated base, base sequence, that would make GUA, and GUA makes valine. So in this case, the amino acid has been changed, and if you change the amino acid in a polypeptide, 
that may change the way that that polypeptide folds into the protein. And so you may find that that protein's shape and function um, have changed quite a bit. This is exactly what happens um, in the hemoglobin gene, one of the genes for hemoglobin, that results in sickle cell anemia. That is caused by a base substitution mutation that um, eventually ends up with glutamic acid being substituted by valine. So again, theme D, all about continuity and change. We wanna be thinking about complementary base pairs, transcription, translation, and the effect of mutations.